Hello and welcome to this webinar from Taylor Hobson. My name is Mike Mills and I'm the Chief Metrologist at Taylor Hobson. This webinar is one of a series covering basic metrology concepts of form and surface texture relating to our products. In this first webinar, we'll be examining the components of a modern profilometer used for the measurement of surface texture. You should be able to see a question and answer panel on your screen. Please use this panel to type in any questions that you might have during the presentation. I'll try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Bear with me a moment. Hopefully you should now be able to see the second slide. Richard, could you just confirm that for me, please? Yes, uh, we see perfectly. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Just a little technical difficulty at this end. OK, so we'll start by asking what a profilometer is in the context of this presentation before looking at the main components of the stylus, gauge and data acquisition system. I won't be covering the whole instrument, and in particular, I'll not be covering anything to do with the drive or control systems. I'll only briefly mention surface texture analysis, as this will be covered in a future presentation. During the presentation, I'm going to use some simplified terms and will omit qualifications that would be necessary to make that terminology strictly correct. Hopefully this will make the presentation easier to follow. Whilst there are different types of profilometer, this presentation will be limited to a stylus profilometer, such as those made by Taylor Hobson. Let's start by defining what I mean by profilometer. As you probably already know, the word profilometer is simply a contraction of the word profile and the word meter. So a profilometer is a meter for measuring profiles. But what is a profile in this context? Well, there's a definition on the screen loosely taken from the ISO standards for surface texture. A profile results from the intersection of a measuring plane with the surface of interest so that the measuring plane is at right angles to the surface. For those of you used to measuring surface texture, the plane is usually also oriented to be perpendicular to the main elements of the surface texture or the lay of the surface. Modern profilometers with their wide range to resolution are often used to measure different properties of the surface such as form, contour or surface texture. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to restrict the scope to surface texture and more specifically, I'll be thinking about surface roughness. So a profilometer works by measuring variations in height from a datum. There are two classes of stylus profilometer based on how that datum is implemented. These classes of instruments are referred to as skidded or skidless. With a skidded instrument, the surface itself is used as the datum. A large radius skid rests on the surface and is used to follow the trend of the surface, whilst the stylus measures variations between the surface itself and the skid's vertical position. This arrangement is highly practical and is often reserved for handheld instruments. These instruments are easily adapted to measuring in different orientations on a component that is still mounted on a machining system. The second class of instrument relies on a remote datum, usually embodied somewhere inside the instrument. Using a remote datum also enables measurement of form or contour provided that there is a sufficiently accurate feedback of the gauging position in the traverse direction. 
In the ISO standards, skidless instruments are considered as reference instruments. This means that in a situation where there's a difference in a parameter value that has been measured on both instrument types, the value from the skidless instrument takes priority. So this diagram, which is not to scale, is shown purely to facilitate discussion of the concepts involved in skidded measurement. So looking at the instrument in this diagram, we can see how the skid will move over the peaks of the surface. The profile depths will be measured by the stylus, measuring from whatever height the skid rests at. Now, although this drawing is not to scale, an important principle can be seen if we consider measurement of a valley near the current location and in a location to the extreme right of the profile. It's clear that the skid will be at different heights in the two locations. The skidded instrument would therefore measure a smaller valley depth on the right hand side than a skidless instrument would. In practice, because of the radius of the skid being very large compared to the spacing of the surface of the peaks, the difference in recorded heights should be very small and within the uncertainty of measurement. So this shows a, a skidless instrument and shows that the gauge is moved in a straight line along a datum surface. The surface under test is usually leveled parallel to the datum prior to measurement. The instrument will now measure the depths of each of the valleys correctly in relation to the highest point on the surface. Here are three different profilometers from Taylor Hobson. The Citronic Duo is an example of a handheld skidded instrument. This particular instrument is highly versatile as it can be split into two parts, allowing the small Travis and data acquisition unit to be located into small places. The Intra and Novus are both examples of skidless systems. The instrument, the, sorry, the Intra can be used with a range of accessories that facilitates specific measurements. For example, we have a special fixture for the measurement of ball bearings. The Novus is an example of a floor mounted measuring system. This requires the component to be brought to the system for measurement rather than taking the instrument to the component. This schematic shows the basic building blocks from the stylus tip through to the computer used for analyzing the data. Now there will be differences between different systems that employ different gauging technologies, but I've chosen to represent it this way to highlight some important considerations. These components are the critical path in the measurement of surface texture. One of the key components of the system is the stylus and often the stylus is interchangeable, such as the one shown here. The stylus can be tailored to a given application by altering the length of the beam or the length of the recess piece to gain access to critical features on the surface of a component. As we shall see later, the length of the shaft will have an impact on the fundamental range and resolution of the instrument. The stylus tip is an essential element forming the contact with the surface under test. Uh, we shall look at this tip in more detail. The size, shape and the material of the tip will all affect the results. For surface texture, these properties are stipulated in the relevant ISO standards. For fine surface finish, the default stylus is a two micron radius, 60 degree diamond conisphere. Other styli are permitted, for example, a 90 degree stylus angle is very common. Stylus radii 5 micron and 10 micron are also common depending on the roughness values being measured and the industry practice. 
In many situations, the impact on parameter values due to changing the stylus size will be very small. So what is a conisphere? A conisphere is a cone whose tip has been rounded into a sphere of the appropriate radius. It's the volume of revolution of the figure shown here on the right. Only the spherical part of the tip is used as the measuring surface, and the reasons for this will become clear shortly. The image here shows a 90 degree conosphere tip. The diamond is brazed or bonded into a metallic substrate and ground to a cone whose included angle is slightly smaller than the desired angle. In this case, slightly smaller than 90 degrees. The very last part of the tip is then ground and polished to achieve the required radius and included angle. Because of its small size, it's extremely difficult to image the tip itself, even with a scanning electron microscope. And that's because we're trying to take a profile of a 3D object, which is a, a, a cone. The stylus tip affects the data acquisition by providing a mechanical filter on the surface. And this can be seen here in this graphic. Firstly, we can see that the path of the stylus, as recorded by the instrument, tends to broaden the peaks and narrow the valleys. Where there's only a single point of contact between the stylus and the surface, then we can and often do compensate for the stylus filtering effects. Secondly, we can see that where the surface is contacted as two points, as shown in the valley of this graphic, there is an area where no information is gathered from the surface. This is shown as the green area here. The true depth of the valley cannot be found. This is a fundamental limit to the measurement process. Now, unlike a linear filter, the filtering effect of the stylus tip is morphological which means that the degree of filtering is dependent on both the wavelength and the depth of the wave being measured. Another important consideration is stylus flanking. This is where the contact is between the surface and the conical part of the tip. In the area shown on this graphic, as shown as green, no useful information is gathered from the surface. In fact, if this were a truly sharp step as shown, the system would be measuring the side of the tip rather than measuring the surface. Stylus flanking should be avoided. Where flanking does occur at the end of the measurements, the areas affected can usually be discarded. Stylus tip material the choice of material is important. Diamond's really good choice for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's extremely hard and so has good wear properties. Nevertheless, we have to remember that it does wear and so the stylus tip should be checked prior to making any critical measurements. And diamond also tolerates being machined into small features and so is ideal for making the small radius tips needed for the surface texture measurement. Diamond has a low coefficient of friction, so it slides over the surface easily and causes minimal abrasion. However, it has to be remembered that diamond is brittle and can be easily damaged by shear stresses. This is particularly true of the stylus tip because there is very little material. Remember, it's only a few microns in diameter. The gauge generates an electrical signal in response to the movement of the stylus tip. And there are many different types of gauge that can be used in a stylus profilometer. Three technologies used by Taylor Hobson are piezo, inductive and interferometric. Piezo transducers are often used in handheld skidding, skidded 
instruments such as our Sertronic Duo. Inductive gauges can be used either with or without a skid, and these days they're usually used in skidless instruments such as our Form Telesurf Intra and Form Telesurf I series products. An inductive system can have switchable gauge ranges facilitating measurement in different applications. Interferometric systems offer a single resolution available across a wide gauge range. This is particularly useful for measuring form, contour and surface texture all in a single operation. Examples of this type of gauge are to be found in our PGI Optics and PGI Novus instruments. The graphic shown here illustrates an inductive gauge. Movement of the stylus tip will cause movement of the armature within the coils of a variable differential transformer. The electronics associated with the transformer produce a signal that is proportional to the displacement of the stylus tip. As can be seen, the stylus is part of a lever mechanism and hence the length of the stylus beam will affect the range and resolution of the system. In a modern digital instrument, the data acquisition system is responsible for converting the signal from analog to digital. This implies some form of sampling, which is usually triggered either by a timer or some feedback from the Travis unit position. There might also be a need for amplification, especially where there are selectable ranges, such as in our inductive systems. However, there will almost certainly be a filtering stage. Filtering is important for two primary reasons, to reduce or suppress noise, and to ensure that sampling conditions are met by limiting the upper frequencies admitted to the analog to digital conversion stage. If the upper frequencies are not adequately suppressed, then aliasing may occur. This is where a signal is sampled more slowly than necessary, resulting in the sampled signal appearing like a lower frequency signal. This is what we can see in this uh, graphic here, which shows a sine wave in blue that is fast and has been sampled more slowly than required. And you can see the, the data points that are sampled on there. And when we draw a sine wave through those points, we get the orange sine wave, which is at a much lower frequency. This is aliasing. The attenuation of the filter in the data acquisition system is dependent on the signal frequency. The key question is where do those frequencies in our signal actually come from? Now clearly the signal we're interested in will come from the surface. In surface texture analysis, we're often concerned with the wavelengths on the surface. Now as the stylus travels over the surface at a constant speed, the gauge signal will contain frequencies that are related to both the surface wavelength and the traverse speed. For a given wavelength, the frequency will increase with the traverse speed and therefore finer surface finish, which often involves shorter wavelengths, it might be necessary to reduce the traverse speed to record these waves accurately. The frequency resulting from a particular wavelength is calculated by the simple equation shown here, that F equals V over lambda, where F is the frequency in Hertz, V is the traverse speed in microns per second, and lambda is the wavelength in microns. Just as an example, if we were to measure a 10 micron wavelength at 250 microns per second, or a quarter of a millimeter per second, then the frequency would be 25 hertz. Increasing the speed to 1000 microns per second or one millimeter per second would increase the frequency to 100 hertz. 
Typical cutoff frequencies for the filters in the data acquisition system would be between 200 and 400 hertz. The cutoff frequency is usually uh, a, a very useful parameter for characterizing filters, but it doesn't tell us the full story of how the filter is going to affect any particular frequency. This is because filters have a roll-off characteristic. Two common roll-off characteristics, the 2CR filter and Gaussian filter, are shown here. As you can see for both filters, the roll-off is significant down to about one-tenth of the cutoff frequency. So data analysis is normally provided by a computer system. In a handheld instrument, this might be a microprocessor, or there might be an opportunity to take data from that system to a separate PC. In the larger benchtop systems, it's normally a PC. The data analysis system is responsible for filtering to select the right bandwidths and for the parameter calculation. Now, parameters are just numbers that qualify some statistic derived from the data, and those parameter definitions are governed by standards, which may be industry standard, national standards, or even international standards. Filtering is used to divide the signal into bands of interest, creating the primary roughness and waviness profiles from which the parameters are going to be calculated. For primary and roughness analysis, a short wavelength filter, lambda s or written as ls filter, is applied. The reasoning behind applying the ls filter is to control the bandwidth of the data used in the analysis to provide comparability between different systems, either from a single supplier or from different suppliers. However, for this to work, the frequencies corresponding to those wavelengths must not be significantly attenuated by the filters in the data acquisition system. Now, we're not going to cover parameters in this presentation. That will be the subject of a future presentation. What is worth noting is that there are many different parameters defined. The parameter definitions are captured in standards, as I've already mentioned. For example, uh, the international standards, such as ISO 4287, national standards, industry standards, or even company standards. And I've shown a few on the slide here. Wherever you're making a surface texture measurement, it is important to know which standard you should be using for the calculation. So we've looked at the building blocks of a typical stylus profilometer and some of the different types available. We've seen how the form of the stylus tip can affect the measurement. We've defined flanking and seen how this leads to erroneous data in the measurement. We've considered components of the data acquisition system, in particular filtering. And we've also seen how incorrect sampling can lead to aliasing. We have briefly mentioned data analysis and noted that there are different sets of standards and how it's important to know which standard to use. We've also seen three important areas of filtering in the system. The stylus forms a morphological filter whose response is a function of both the surface wavelength and its amplitude. The data acquisition system will contain some form of filtering particularly an anti-alias filter. The filter response is a function of the frequency of the signal, which for a given surface wavelength is related to the measurement speed. In data analysis, filters are applied to control the surface wavelength bandwidth and thereby provide comparability of results across systems. These days, there are many filters that we can choose from However, the filter response is typically a function of the wavelength. We need to take all of these filters into consideration when assessing the measurement process 
and stylus form is governed by OZO standards. And there's a recommendation for the choice of stylus size. The filtering in the data acquisition system is outside the control of the user. So the one parameter that a user might be able to control is the measurement speed. On fine surface finish, we might need to slow down the measurement speed to avoid excess filtering. Well, thank you all for your time and attention. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for the presentation and thank you to everybody for attending. Mike, we have a few questions. Are you OK for, for answering these? Yes, of course, I okay. can try. All right, here we go. So uh, first question I've got is uh, from you, uh, one of the attendees is, uh, what standards do Taylor Hobson machines use to analyze data? What standards do Taylor Hobson machines use to analyze data? So we normally work to the ISO standards. Um, there are many of them. Um, we also incorporate some um, industry standards. So for example, there are some VDA standards incorporated within the analysis. Mm. So the ISO standards, the parameters for the majority of surface finish, standard surface finish, if you like, are covered in ISO 4287. There are some other parameters that are covered in ISO 12085, which is the uh, motif parameter set. And we also support the RK parameter set, which is in the ISO 13565 series. Hope that answers that fully. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I've got quite a few questions coming in, so I'll keep, uh, keep going if that's OK. OK, yeah. yeah. So the next question I've got is, uh, does ISO recommend use of skidless instruments for research measurements? Skidless or skidded? Skidless, it says. So. Okay, yes, so the ISO recommendation is that you should use a skidless mm. instrument. That's the way I interpret mm. uh, the, 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 the standards. And the skidless instrument is referred to as a reference type instrument right. within the ISO standards. Thank you, okay. And the next question I've got is, can we measure crankshaft radius? Slightly different question, but. That's a very good question. That's outside of um, what we're talking about in terms of um, form. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, in terms of surface texture, because that's going into form measurement. And yes, potentially because we manufacture form measuring instruments, we can measure the radius of a crankshaft pin yes. or main bearing. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, one more question is, uh, do Taylor Hobson make their own styli? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we don't make the diamonds. The, the yeah. production of the diamond is a very specialized process, so uh, they're purchased, uh, but the rest of the stylus is made by Taylor Hobson. Right. Thank you. Okay. And I think and it's the, also worth yeah, sorry yeah. Richard to interrupt yeah. it's also no worth um stating that um we offer a design service for special styli for our instruments as well so we make a number of custom styli uh, for specific applications and I'm, i mentioned that along the way in the presentation mm, thank you Okay, another question has come in. Uh, is there a lower limit for RA that you would recommend for a five micron probe and a two micron probe is required? So there are recommendations and they're given in the ISO standards. So I'd refer you back to okay. um, ISO 4288. I think it is that has that recommendation. It's a lower limit, yeah, thank you for that. Okay, uh, I think that's all of the questions. Could you say just a little bit about stylus force? Uh, the stylus force on the on the diamond stylus and what would be recommended? Yes, of course, the ISO standard for the stylus force, it's stipulated as 750 micronewtons mm. or 75 milligrams, and that's measured at the centre part of the gauge range. Okay. The uh, ISO standard also stipulates that there should be a zero spring constant, so the force should be constant throughout the gauge range. Mm. In most cases, that's impractical. Uh, 
and there is a small spring involved there, so the stylus force does change throughout the gauge range. That, that's fairly normal unless you've got a, a stylus that's held by gravity, for example. Thank you. And another question come in. Uh, how do you inspect a stylus tip prior to use? That's a very good question. If you're blessed with a scanning electron microscope, that would be one way. Um, another way of measuring a stylus tip very, very quickly without taking the stylus off the instrument is to use a stylus tip condition standard. There are a number of these that are available on the market and typically they might be um, a very sharp triangle with a very small radius. By measuring that triangle, you'll be able to see the uh, curve that you get as the stylus tip goes over the sharp radius. That curve is um, a combination of both the curve on the tip standard, tip condition standard, and the uh, any deformation in the tip itself. And that's a very, very good way of checking a standard, uh, sorry, a stylus, and it's a very practical way of doing it. Mm. Mike, I think that's brought us to the end of our questions, uh, only to say there was a new one come in. Let's just have a look. <laughs> <laughs> is there any more detail available about uh, aliasing filters and is it done by default? Right, so anti-aliasing is done by default. Um, it's part of a requirement for um, a data acquisition system. And if you look at any textbook on digital signal processing, you'll be able to find the background information there. Uh, if you pop aliasing and uh, digital data acquisition into a, a search engine, I'm sure you will come up with lots of articles that explain that. Thank you. I think that's brought, it brought us to the end of our questions and uh, to say thank you very much to everybody for, for all the questions and interest and uh, particularly uh, Mike for, for your uh, work in, in preparing this and presenting it. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you all and goodbye from me. Yeah, bye bye.